My name is Kristen Noreen, and I'm a professor of art history at Loyola Marymount University. I'd like to welcome you to Kaleido LA, the Department of Art and Art History's annual guest speaker series. Uh, for the past nine years, Kaleido LA has provided a connection between LMU and the arts community in Los Angeles and well beyond. Uh, during the 2021-2022 academic year, the Department of Art and Art History in collaboration with the LeBand Art Gallery is uh, thematically, um, will thematically center artists and art historians whose uh, artwork, lived experiences, and scholarship foreground issues of racial, economic, and social justice. I'd like to uh, turn to my colleague, Diane Meyer, professor of photography, uh, who will introduce today's speaker. Diane? Okay, hi. Um, okay. Uh, anyway, um, uh, uh, I'm Diane Meyer. I'm a professor of photography here at LMU. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. It is my great pleasure to introduce Justin Randolph Thompson as the speaker for today's Kaleido LA talk. Uh, Justin is a new media artist, cultural facilitator and educator based in Florence. In fact, actually some of you here may have taken a class with Justin last semester because through Zoom, Justin was actually able to teach our special topics in photography class, uh, photography in the archive. Um, and I'm just thrilled that Zoom again has provided an opportunity for our students to meet with Justin. And um, Justin is the director and co-founder of Black History Month Florence, a multifaceted exploration of African and African diasporic cultures in the context of Italy. And um, they have produced over 300 events and programs, uh, including on being present, a collaboration with the Uffizi Gallery the Recovery Plan, a, cult, a Black Cultural Center in Florence, which hosts creative research connected to the cultural production of Afro-descendant people and cultures just opened in Florence last month in September, 2021. Uh, Justin received a BFA from the University of Tennessee and an MFA from American University. His own artistic practice has been widely recognized and exhibited around the world, including at uh, some of the most prominent museums, such as the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Museo Reina Sofia in Madrid, uh, the Textile Museum in Washington, DC, the Studio Museum Harlem, uh, Museum Madre in Naples, uh, Villa Romana in Florence, and numerous galleries in, uh, across the, the US and, and abroad. Um, his work has also been recognized by numerous grants, including a Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Artist Grant, a Franklin Furness Grant, fellowships from Socrates Sculpture Park and Foundation Marcellino Voughton, amongst many, many others. Uh, please welcome me today. Uh, in, uh, please join me in welcoming Justin today. We're really thrilled to have him join us. Thank you so much for the, the introductions and um, thank you for the, the invitation to um, share my work and research in this in this really fantastic context um, that, that is really connected to the ways it's it's really connected to the ways in which I like to think about art and the capacity of art to really move things from a social standpoint to really shape the realities in which we, we live. Um, it was a real pleasure to be able to teach for, for LMU um, and to think about the the role of the archive, the ways in which we understand the archive. Um, the ways in which we use or don't use that term in connection to our own objects, and then what it means to sort of be the keepers of our own past. Um, and I think that um, that course for me, which is the first and only time I've ever taught it, really awoke a lot of things um, that, that are at the um, intersection between my own art practice and um, uh, my activism. Um, so it was really uh, quite a pleasure. Um, tonight, I'm gonna um, share with you a presentation um, that um, it comes through a lot of different things I'll see if I can first share that to make sure that we kind of get things going. And there we go. Um, and um, I thought that it might be a good way to, um, well, I, I, I like throwing into conversations um, the dimensions that are sort of uh, questions that I'm grappling with in the moment. Um, and uh, in this moment, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is the relationship between presence and representation. Um, and Tonight, um, I was just at the Recovery Plan, our Black Cultural Center, um, uh, introducing an event that was happening, uh, the first in-person in event outside the opening of the space. Um, and it was dedicated to thinking about the 1990 hunger strike that took place in Florence that was initiated by the Senegalese community. Um, and it was a number of people that participated in that strike had written about it and had been thinking about it. And one of the things that kept coming up in their conversation was the difference between a physical presence um, in a given territory or 
in a space, um, and then uh, forms of representation, whether we're talking about political or social representation, or the sort of agency to represent ourselves. Um, and it was an intriguing way to think about what's changed since 1990, and then all those continuities that we sort of know history to bring for us. Um, so I thought it would be a good idea to sort of talk about that. And I wanted to walk you in the door. Let's see if this works. Hold on one second. Let's make sure my thing works. There we go. Um, I wanted to walk you in the door through an actual project that I'm working on right now um, that um, I, I recently in 2021 um, received uh, a research fellowship through the Italian Council. Um, it's, it's one of the few um, state, um, state money, the, the few opportunities to get state money in Italy um, dedicated to art um, and to research. And they had just started this new fellowship that is uh, designed to give individual artists um, support around their research. Um, I proposed, um, uh, it was the sort of moment where I was um, seeing that I wasn't going to be teaching as much as I would have been teaching. And I thought it might be a good idea to dive deep into some things that I've been working on for a while. I decided to dive into a project that I had um, sort of crafted and begun to work on. That's a, a film and it's called Minted in Enemy Bronze. Um, and it's a film that was actually designed based on this medallion that you see here, which I actually have um, physically here with me as well. Um, it's a medallion that actually comes from uh, some, some wars that were fought between um, 1915 and 1918 as part of the unification, uh, sort of some conclusive chapters of the unification of Italy. Um, and the intriguing thing for me, and it is not so much the history of that war specifically, but the fact that this medal, which was given to soldiers, um, was literally uh, minted in enemy bronze and it's written on it. Um, and so um, the ammunition and potentially any other um, thing that was taken from the enemy was melted down to make these medallions. And I like to think a little bit about the ways in which materiality um, has this capacity to really outlive um, its, its, um, its origins, right? And so we can think about this in relation to the marble that's used in sculpture that has been resting in mountains for thousands of years. Um, but we can also think about that in this practice, which was actually pretty common of uh, taking bronze objects, uh, whether we're talking about um, sculptures dedicated to deities of the past um, or the ammunition and transforming those into something else. Um, and I like to think about the sort of spiritual traces or the, the origins of that material that remain embedded within that object. And somehow that seemed like a good place to start for thinking about um, one, um, you know, it, a lot of my work revolves around black history in the context of Italy and really thinking about this space as a space that has hosted and been in dialogue with the African continent since um, history has been recorded. Um, and I think that the idea of enemy bronze um, being something that is talked about in the context of uh, like more of a civil war in a certain sense, right? Uh, this idea of unifying and wh who the enemy is and how those borders are being defined. I thought it was a really good way to sort of start to sort of dive into some things. Um, and so this medal is just sort of symbolic of that. Um, but I'll show you a few stills from that film that I think help us to sort of uh, um, think about those things a little bit more. Um, you might not be able to read very well this. It says, we are almost witnessing an attempt to cancel notion on the basis of which over 2000 years, humanity seemed to have founded its achievements. Um, and this is a, a fragment of a speech that was given in 1962 by the then president of, Sen of Senegal, Leopold Senghor, um, in Florence in 1962 at Palazzo Vecchio. Um, he was invited by the mayor. And the person that you see here um, is Antonella Bundu, who was the first black female mayoral candidate um, ever in Florence. Um, she did not win, but she's a city hall representative. She represents the opposition to the current government. Um, and I asked her to, to deliver that same speech in the same room where that speech was given in 1962 um, as a sort of political representative in that space. And then also because her parents actually met um, through a, a, a series of dialogues that were created by the mayor who invited Leopold Senghor in the first place. So there's all these sort of layers of history that are built into that. And again, I like to think about this in regards to sort of a presence that we know about, but then also what it means to have political representation in some way. Um, and Antonella certainly represents that. Um, these are another object that is a part of, this is a still from the film, that's why I think it looks so weird. Um, Th these are objects that I filmed inside the Museo Paolo Orsi. Uh, it's an archaeological museum in Syracuse, Sicily. These are objects that um, are said to represent 
um, African theater figures. And um, what's intriguing about that is that they, they, they don't actually represent African people. Um, they represent um, actors wearing masks that represent African people. And so um, actually within the same museum, there is the mold that they used to use to make the masks. And so um, there's this interesting layer that's happening in thinking about um, you know, a, a theatrical production in Roman antiquity that is representing Africa through um, non-African actors wearing African faces and all those sort of layers and complexities of history that are embedded in there. And so again, in a certain sense, in this object, there is this presence of Africa, but is it representation, right? That becomes this sort of looming question with a lot of the things that I'm working with um, in sort of in what ways were they being represented, right? Um, and as a way of sort of diving into um, some of what was mentioned um, of, of the work that's been carried out, I wanted to introduce a little bit of Black History Month Florence, just really um, super briefly, um, because there's actually just a whole lot to unpack when we go into this tunnel. Um, but uh, Black History Month Florence was initiated in 2016 um, by myself together with a friend of mine who's an artist named Andre Halyard. Um, Andre has been in Florence um, for over 30 years. Um, I've been in Florence for over 20 years, and we sort of came together after a series of exchanges and um, uh, episodes, public conversations, private conversations, and decided that we wanted to sort of speak something into existence um, uh, because it, we felt like we needed it. Um, uh, Andre, when, when we uh, first reconnected after years that uh, we had sort of marginally known each other, he said a really simple thing to me that actually I think still uh, sticks. And it was, he said, I need home. And, um, and in saying that, um, he, he was really just talking about sort of like uh, some sort of connection to the culture of home, like in the US and how we had met each other through, through music really. And in the music that we shared, he heard home. And so he was like, so we, we, need, we, we need to be together. Like I need home, you need home. We, we both do. And out of that um, sort of exchange grew sort of a relationship that developed into Black History Month Florence. We started it in 2016 um, just simply by reaching out to a whole range of different institutions, organizations, and individuals that had been doing research and thinking about Blackness in Italy, um, and really just reaching out to, to um, uh, an audience and saying, in February, um, every February now, there's going to be Black History Month Florence, and this is the program. Um, we developed that program. Uh, the first one we developed it in about um, uh, about a month's time, and there was 20 events that happened within it. What you're seeing here is sort of a lineup of um, spaces on the left and on the right, um, a list of the names of the protagonists that were involved. And we were very fortunate to have uh, a number of protagonists that are really, really incredible um, that, that joined us, and um, we were able to sort of co-promote a range of events that were taking place. Um, so um, out of that, um, you know, um, out of that sort of spark, let's say, um, and that spark um, developed into what is basically now Black History Month Florence um, to some degree, uh, because in 2017, we, the team was joined by um, Janine Gael Yuji, um, who is a curator um, and a really incredible being who was here in Florence at the time. And um, uh, happened very strangely to have a little bit of time on our hands to really sit there and grapple with these things together. And we developed the project into something that out of 20 events became 50 events. And it really quickly became something where we had to sort of break it down into um, children's events, um, tours, cooking, um, conversations, art exhibitions, um, concerts, film programming, and so on and so forth. Um, so we kind of created this series of different approaches to thinking about blackness in this space. And it was really various from um, very locally or oriented um, reflections on history, contemporary culture, um, exhibitions, um, dialogues about sort of contemporary notions of migration, dialogues about antiquity, and all of these things sort of coming together. Um, it was a really, really rich program. And basically from there, we sort of took off um, and, and just kept up with it. Um, Basically, um, it's really difficult to navigate um, what Black History Month Florence represents now um, because in the process we've accumulated so many layers. Um, and so I'll just share with you the posters of these and not go into what we did. But um, in, in the um, sort of six editions that we've done, we have accumulated over 300 events. 
Um, I don't know how many of those are exhibitions, but it's, it's like we, we typically do around 10 or 12 exhibitions a year. Um, so there's a lot of art. Um, I don't know how many conversations, but it's a whole lot of conversations. Um, and in the process, it's also about these, these ideas of um, approaches to um, self-forming, -form right? Sort of self-learning, uh, an opportunity to sort of learn a whole range of things that I simply did not know. Um, and I'm imagining a lot of the audience didn't know, and we can learn together through all of these sort of sharings, um, through the invitation towards scholars, to the invitation towards artists. And a lot of what we've also focused on is, is um, international residencies that tend to bring artists into Italy to be working for a year or more. And in that process, the ways in which um, artists of African descent tend to gravitate towards aspects of Italian history that connect to Africa and that a lot of times are very under-researched. Um, so um, we started in 2019 with a thematic framework. And so we started to use sort of musical terms like adagio, um, which um, you know, um, means sort of slowly or um, uh, gingerly. And in the context of the Italian language, it, it, it can mean both slow and it tends to be placed within areas of where you need to use caution. And we like the idea that this could be an invitation and a critique, an invitation to sort of slow down and appreciate certain complexities that I think were really evacuated from thinking about blackness in this space. Um, and then also uh, a critique of um, the, the ways in which actually when it comes to really social movements and the dynamics of history, um, things are actually incredibly slow. Um, and we have to sort of be patient to sort of make it, make it through, right? Um, to sort of um, thrive in a way, we have to sort of be patient enough to sort of just uh, know that there's a lot of things that need to be done and there will always be a lot of things that need to be done. Um, and um, sort of diving through Obrigato in 2020 was actually our very um, last, uh, until now, opportunity to do a full program um, live and direct. Um, and so we finished our program just before COVID-19 hit Italy. Um, you all may know that Italy was one of the first countries to really uh, be hit and it was hit um, incredibly hard. Um, and there's a way in which every um, February for me is one of these like incredibly enriching experiences that I sort of feed off of for the coming time, right? So all of those shared dialogues, I sort of spend time digesting and, and you know, marinating on in this time. And 2020 really, um, you know, uh, was so incredibly rich that it really provided me with food for thought um, that has lasted me through today um, and has really fed me spiritually and everything else. And um, I'm really, really grateful um, for the fact that this exists as something that can do that, um, not just for me, but for a range of people that are here. Um, Ostinato is the edition that we did um, this year. And you can see underneath that, that there's written Black History Month Bologna, because in 2020, we actually um, helped to co-found Black History Month in Bologna as well, working with an artist named Patrick Joel Tacheda Yanku. Um, Patrick's uh, an artist originally from Cameroon, based in Bologna who um, came to me and asked if we would be willing to help him to, to, to start this work also in Bologna. And um, it made sense um, and we, we stepped towards it. Um, and so far um, they had a, the, un, the misfortune of Bologna being hit much quicker than Florence with COVID-19. And so they were shut down halfway through their program while we were able to go straight through. Um, and so both editions of Black History Month Bologna have been really, really affected by that. Um, and we're still sort of grappling with what that means. Um, but in 2021, because we moved a lot of our work online, we did have four exhibitions here in Florence. We had um, an artist residency that was set up for four artists that we brought in. And um, we had another residency that was a month long where we brought an artist in here. There was a whole range of exchanges we were able to do in person, um, but a lot of it was online, which allowed us to expand the walls. And so we did uh, a range of projects in Naples. We did a range of projects in um, uh, Rome, Milan, Turin, um, and Bologna, of course. Um, so it sort of expanded what we were able to do in the ways in which we were able to think about a collective form of organizing. Um, and you know, the reason I was saying it's kind of saying it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard. Kind of hard to really many different platforms. At this point, we're actually counting, I think, eight research platforms within the work of Black History Month Florence and within what's now called the Recovery Plan. Uh, Black Archive Alliance was the first of them, and it was designed to answer a very simple question, which is um, uh, what Black history? Uh, why Florence? Um, and, um, you know, the idea that we knew that, that, that um, you know, Black 
uh, African presence in the context of the Italian territory is something that is, is age old and very documented. Um, it was disturbing to sort of find that question coming up so often. And then it was also disturbing to find so many people that were super excited about the work, but uninterested in doing something outside of February. And so as a form of sort of continuity together with Villa Romana, who's one of our organizers, um, we came together and created Black Archive Alliance, um, which went into private, private and public archives and collections and began to look at what they had in relation to Africa and to, to share research that was already done, to foster research among students. And what was born from it, first and foremost, was a small catalog. This catalog was designed in a way where you had to go to each of the different archival sites to collect the different pages as a way of thinking about access, as a way of thinking about the sort of um, ways in which archives are often these sort of private spaces that you don't actually get granted access to. We did a range of tours within those archives and spaces, and we mixed things up so that we had private um, archives, collections of objects and images that were coming from individuals that we thought were really relevant to this context, um, alongside um, things like the Uffizi galleries, which then came up later. Um, you can see here um, two images of tours and one image of the sort of um, exhibitions that we've been doing with this project. So those stands that you see on the top left, which are housed in this image inside of uh, an organization that was called Istituto um, um, Agronomico Altremare, which is designed to assess the holdings in the, um, the Italian colonies in East Africa, mainly. Um, this is now an agency for development. And um, so we brought into there these stands and actually set up the research that was done directly within the archive as a way then of also thinking about how this might be able to be shared from one space to the next and so on and so forth. Um, so a lot of things happened in that period. In the second edition, we decided to make it specifically student run research. And so we invited a range of students to work with mentors on the development of new research and to extend the research that was done in the first edition. Um, we had a student run and student led conference. Um, these are just a few images from it. If anyone's interested in it on our website, you can find also um, the abstracts that the students wrote and you can hear the recordings of their interventions. Um, and this is a way of expanding also what it means to do like um, uh, academic research, uh, to do research in the archives um, and to sort of um, stimulate more research because what we were finding is that a lot of the things that were within these archives were simply under-researched. So they're there, they're present, but they're simply not being um, represented within the sort of documentation and the, the, the theory that's emerging. Um, and so it was an invitation to sort of engage in that um, and to sort of get beyond some of those hurdles that a lot of times are just simply, um, they're stated in the way that these are, this is the way that things are uh, because this is the way that things were. And those are uh, things that we're really accustomed to coming in contact with as an approach. And we really strongly reject it. Um, the third edition that we did, we actually asked five individuals um, to work with us and to talk about the sort of archives that they've come in contact with, the ways in which they as individuals, as researchers, represent archives, um, and sort of to expand the ways in which we're thinking about things. So Jessica Sartiani, these names that you see below, Jessica Sartiani is a barista, um, she's a coffee expert, works a lot on the development of the relationship between um, colonial history and coffee. Um, the exportation of coffee beans along with the exportation of slave labor. Angelica Pizzarini, who was a sociologist, um, was writing about um, the relationship between the colonial, Italian colonial uh, representation of the black body in uh, commerce and commercials um, in publicity and the representation of the black body in sort of contemporary um, politics in the context of Italy, which connects a lot to slave um, slave-like labor that's happening in the south of Italy, predominantly in agricultural um, spaces. Um, Patrick Joel Tacheriancu, who I mentioned before in relation to Black History Month Bologna, he um, decided to do research into the Cameroonian community um, and the connections between uh, an Italian-run art school that he attended in Cameroon and what that sort of diplomatic relationship was established to do. Um, Jordan Anderson, who um, is um, uh, a journalist, he runs, uh, he's an editor of a magazine. Um, he uh, decided to dive into the research of some anti-racist um, movements of the past, uh, specifically in 1989 with the murder of Jerry Maslow in, the, in the, just south of Rome. And um, uh, Simao Amista, lastly, uh, who is an anthropologist, um, decided to talk about the spiritual, the African spiritual retentions in diaspora. 
Um, and so all of these things became a part of how we were thinking about the archive and the expansion of it. Uh, the last platform I'm going to share with you um, here before we look at on being present um, with you, Fitzi, is the YGBI. Um, and it's really um, YGB, um, for th those of you that sort of like know that kind of lingo, that kind of language, will probably recognize those letters. Um, it's it's the, the words young, gifted, and black. Um, it comes from uh, Lorraine Hansberry. Um, and um, we really felt that amongst all of our, our platforms, which were dedicated to thinking about the past, we really needed to have some form or some approach for really thinking about younger people that are making work right now. And for those of you that don't know, contemporary culture in Italy is not really supported. Um, it's not, uh, there's not money that's going into it. The institutional support is really uh, limited and the kind of narration around that work also tends to be incredibly problematic. When it comes to black youth, it's even, it's even worse. Um, and so what happens is that a lot of the youth in Italy are actually leaving the country. If we look at statistics, I, I don't really want to get into them, but if we look at statistics, there's a lot of conversation about migration and the impact of migration on Italy. Um, but what a lot of people are not looking at is the outflux of youth and talent from Italy, which is um, at least um, three times as many people are coming to the country um, are leaving the country. And so what it also means to have to sort of replace this, this talent, this youth in this space. And we wanted to do something about making it more hospitable to be in Italy, to, to, to develop strategies for self-organization, for collectivity, to support each other, especially as young artists. And so we brought together in the first edition, five uh, young artists. Um, it's kind of weird, you know, because like with the, the last letter, so it would be like young, gifted, black, Italian, but really we also let that letter be Italy because um, it's not even really about identifying as Italian um, in any way. Um, and the notions of black Italianness, it's, um, it's, it's really a complicated state. It's, it, that's the way that some people identify, but it's certainly not the majority. And so we have to really also think about the language that we use to sort of define these things. So these are a group of artists, um, some of which were born in Italy, some of which arrived later, um, some of which um, were born in Italy and left the country, right? And we thought about what it might mean for them to come together for just 10 days and to talk about diaspora and to talk about collectivity. Um, this was supported by Ontario College of Art Design who provided us with studios and the student hotel who gave us um, a place to stay and some classrooms to work in. Um, the first edition was led by the mentor who you see here, Andrea Fatona, who's uh, coupled with Leif uh, Gerlefia, um, who was brought in um, from um, OCAD. Um, the artists that are in this project are um, represented by these images that you see here, Francis Offman in the top left, um, Emmanuel Yoro in the middle, and on the bottom, Razia Perin, on the right, Binta Diao, and on the bottom, Victor Fotsonier. And um, all of these artists, I'm really, really happy to say that since their 10 day residency here, besides us being able to so, sort of support them by really pushing them into a series of exhibitions, um, pushing grant opportunities towards them, um, giving them advice where they need it in relation to institutional um, conversations and everything else, um, they've, they've all been ex incredibly successful um, in really sort of growing their own careers. Um, and helping each other sort of move forward. Um, so that's been really exciting. Um, we, these are just a couple images from some of the exhibitions that we did. This has been to Diao's exhibition at the Museo Maga, which is up near Milan. Um, the exhibition was called Nero Sangue. This is images of on the top, Victor Fotsonier's exhibition, which was done inside the Museo Maga. And still within Maga, the, uh, the exhibition dedicated to Francis Offman. Um, these are some of the paintings. Um, we also did an exhibition for Razzo Perin, but uh, I was unable to put the images in here. So um, shout out to Razzo. Um, these are the images of the four artists that were invited in in 2021 for the second edition. Um, and it is Silvia Rosi, Aji Die, Kelly Costigliolo, and Christian Offman. Um, and they were all led by um, a mentor um, named Arlette Louise Indicose, um, who is the artistic co-director of Savvy Contemporary, which is this incredible cultural space in Berlin. And she led them in thinking about diaspora. We've worked with all of them now on thinking about how to sort of support them. Uh, what I didn't mention about the previous group is that those five researchers, which you saw within Black Archive Alliance, we actually affiliated them with each of those five artists as a way of sort of expanding their capacity and their interest in research so that the artistic research would feed um, the more academic research and the academic research would feed the artistic research and so that there would be even more collectivity. Um, and this brings us to um, this, this project here, which has really been um, sort of a 
work in progress. Um, but um, basically in 2019, um, uh, we pitched to the director of the um, Galleria degli Uffizi. For those that don't know the Uffizi Galleries, it's um, one of the, it's probably one of the biggest um, institutions in Europe dedicated to Renaissance art. Um, and we decided that would be a really great thing to sort of think about the Black African presence that is within um, that museum's collection and the ways in which that Black African presence might help them to narrate their own selves and their own role in art history a little bit more, um, um, a, little, a little more completely, let's say. Um, and basically within that process, um, we developed um, a whole range of different practices. What the idea was to do a two year research project where we invited historians to think about um, Black African presence within these paintings. Um, at, from when I came over as a student, I came to Florence in 1999 as a student and um, I encountered these images and I began drawing them. I began holding on to and collecting um, these images and really um, searching for some form of information about them. And really it was incredibly difficult to find when it wasn't simply absent. And to be honest, like that's true also of artists that you'd be really surprised, like uh, Veronese, who is this Venetian painter who, I mean, there are so many black Africans in those paintings and yet there's so little written about those black Africans. Um, so it's kind of incredible that the, this presence is there, but there's really no um, response or reflection that tends to show up around them. Um, for, for whatever reason, they've been left out of that narrative. Um, they end up just being sort of a figure there. Some people talk about them as um, compositional elements, which is really interesting thought. Um, and um, as a student wanting to know more about what these figures might've represented, why they were there, um, what kind of presence they actually spoke to, um, I, I thought it was really important to make sure that in this project, we did it as an online um, virtual exhibition using uh, inviting historians to use a language that was a, a not overly academic language. Um, so making sure that the language was um, loose enough to really let a lot of um, uh, people come into contact with and access this. And um, we really worked um, hard to sort of um, do bring high resolution images in, clean those images up and really make them accessible to everyone so that in tour guides all of a sudden have something to sort of say about those figures that they've always seen but never really knew how to talk about. We did two editions. We involved um, 15 different historians and art historians. We talked about 22 different images. And these are, these are just two of the, the cover pages, I guess, of um, the project. And you can access them online on the Uffizi's website. It was the most successful um, uh, virtual exhibition that the Uffizi has ever done. Um, within the first year, I think it had over 21,000 um, viewings. Um, it got international coverage. And um, also, we did a series of videos and the social media rank rates of the Uffizi really, really went up. Um, and just to look at a couple of these images, um, it's just to share with you and think again back to that title, presence versus representation. And so um, the project is called On Being Present. And actually that title comes from this incredible um, thinker who's uh, quoted here, Nana Aduse Poku. Um, it, she wrote this essay that's called On Being Present, Where You Wish to Disappear. Um, it wasn't connected to this work, but I thought it was really appropriate in thinking about this presence. Um, and then also sort of desires to sort of be there or not be there, um, the opportunity to have the choice. Um, and I think in thinking about um, the idea of presence versus representation, um, all of these are images that are created by white artists um, of Africans. And um, in a certain sense, um, uh, a lot of the pushback that, that we, we did receive in, in the moment of opening the project, mainly from the far right, um, had to do um, with what they were seeing as representation, which in reality was, was presence. Uh, we were simply connoting presence. Um, but they were seeing in this presence a possibility of representation. Um, this is uh, Katerina, which is a really early portrait that was done by Albrecht Durer. Um, and uh, she, was in, she was a slave um, of um, a commercial representative of um, the Portuguese king. Um, so we can think about sort of what that image represents, what kind of presence it attests to. This is from the Allegory of America um, by Volterano. Um, and, you know, also here again, um, this is uh, an allegory of, of America, and yet we have this sort of Black African presence um, as a child with a parrot who's holding the arm of, of, of a white woman. 
And so again, thinking about presence versus representation in this, um, this is a painting by um, Gianni um, of uh, uh, a figure who was part of the court, the Florentine court. Um, and so again, like within this, this image was actually created as a bit of a comic relief. This is the detail of it. Um, but if you see the larger image, you get a better sense of how this is meant to be uh, funny. Um, and so also the sort of painting as joke for the the people that attended the Florentine court, because we also have to remember that these paintings were not made for public consumption. They were made for the consumption of a very specific group of people invited into these spaces. Right? Um, this is another sort of comic relief image um, that portrays uh, a figure named Piero il Moro. Um, Piero, uh, who knows if that's like an actual name or if that's just a name that's given. Um, il Moro actually just means the more, so it's uh, very nondescript. Um, the other two figures are two elderly women that used to sell um, eggs and, and food to the, the, the court. And so this was made as a portrait that was supposed to be funny because you had um, sort of like peasants, if you will, um, in this context here of official portraiture. And they were painted by uh, Justus Sudermans, who is um, the official court painter um, of a lot of the Medici family. Um, and so um, one of the little details is that uh, Piero is actually making on the shoulder of this woman a, the fig gesture with his thumb. It's a really lewd sort of sexual gesture just to sort of make sure that it wasn't lost on the viewer that this was a joke. Um, and um, we have other images like this that help us to think even more about presence versus representation. This is an image of a figure who's known as Benedetto Silva. Um, and it says on the arrow that he's holding, just to be explicit, um, Benedetto Silva, the white moor, um, the son of two um, black people from Angola. And so there's, there's all this sort of explicit language to make sure that we get what's so particular about this image. Um, he's represented against the backdrop of um, the, the sea uh, with boats in the background, there's shells, there's all these things that are designed to really frame and tell you what is so particular about this scene. Um, again, thinking about who's actually engaged in this. Interestingly, we have another image of him that was done later um, by Domenico Tempestini. Um, and, you know, it portrays a completely different person um, in terms of like the sense of representation and what's going on with the painting itself, what it's designed to do. Um, and we'll, we'll end with this, um, which is um, an image of Alessandro um, de Medici, um, who is the um, son of um, uh, um, Pope, well, it's said to be son of Pope Leon the Eleventh, and um, uh, an African servant in the um, uh, Medici household named Simonetta. And um, so we have this figure who went on to be the first Duke of, of Florence. Um, he came out despite sort of uh, being illegitimate, um, despite um, sort of um, uh, coming having um, African descent. Um, he came into um, you know, power, full power within the Florence of that period. This is a portrait that is done by Bronzino. And um, you know, he, he was a tyrant, um, like so many of the other rulers of the time. Um, and so again, I asked that question, or what, what does it mean in regards to presence versus representation? In this case, we have someone who represented uh, political power, um, but is that something that is helpful to really thinking about um, you know, uh, the black past, is that something to be celebrated? Should we celebrate sort of um, a ruler who was a tyrant? Um, is it important to celebrate him because he's black? Um, all of these things sort of are questions that I've been grappling with and thinking about. And um, I can't say that I have an answer to it, but uh, maybe that's something that we can sort of um, end with in terms of just thinking about that. And um, just, um, it was mentioned that we did, we just opened a space called the Recovery Plan, plan sorry, the Recovery Plan in Florence. Um, we started it as a pop-up in 2019 and um, as a way of sort of creating a, a Black cultural center that could host all of these different platforms which we've been developing. We have um, uh, sort of a, a monthly column, we have the archival project, we have all these different things. And finally, we have a physical space where we can actually unpack all of those things and where we can create a sense of the togetherness of all these platforms and how they work together in expanding our knowledge and capacity to really think about history. Um, so thank you so much for uh, time. Hopefully I did good on time and not over so that we have time for questions. Great, thank you so much, Jeff, for so much. 
a really thought provoking uh, talk and and I'm sure that we have some questions I'd like to open up the floor, you can either. Um, you know, raise your hand uh, on mic, uh, put a message in the chat box. box. And I've just lost my screen. Just so. lost well, I, I'm gonna start off with a question for you, um, Justin. I'm, I, I think it's amazing what you've been able to accomplish in, in such a short period of time. And, and it's just like, exhausting hearing about everything that that you've been able to do um, in in line with what you were saying about the difficulty for people finding support in Italy and leaving Italy. Um, how have you been able to find support for these projects who who is funding you. Um, what you know, how are you financing these events. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a like it's like a, a dangerous but really good question. Um, it's, it's, um, we do so many things that there's always this sort of question of like how do you how do you get that done if there's not really support here. The truth is that in um, 300 events and um, all the work that we've done, um, we've never had administrative support. Um, there's never been uh, funding administratively. I have a team now of 20 uh, volunteers. I work as a volunteer. Um, the artwork that I make and and. The few things that I sell, um, the lectures that I give in relation to it, um, all of that goes to contribute to the development of our, our center and of our space and to provide a sort of baseline for us to work with. Outside of that, we've been really, you know, the, when we first started Black History Month, um, Florence, a lot of people told us that you can't really do anything in Florence without money. And um, as artists, you know, um, I think that uh, for me, art is a lot about the, the recalibration of, of value, uh, whether that's economic value, social value, or any other kind of value. And because of that, like money is, is rarely sort of a hurdle to really making art. Um, we sort of understand that that's like an important element, but that, you know, you, you, it's not that you stop making art um, when there's no funding available, right? Um, fortunately. Um, and so we've really been creative in our strategy. A lot of what we've done is develop templates that will allow anyone to organize anywhere um, with or without money based on um, how much time they're willing to dedicate to it. I'm a really good mediator. And so um, I know how to sort of walk into certain institutions and certain spaces and to um, help them to understand that when they're doing an event, it's really their event, it's really for them. And we're simply gonna share it, we're gonna co-promote it. We can advise on who might be uh, good to be in there or not. Um, we have curated a range of projects um, in a lot of different contexts, but the funding typically comes from within the institutions that we're working with directly around projects that they've been hosting. Um, and that's something that's been uh, an ongoing strategy. We have a lot of, uh, we partner with the city of Florence who co-promotes our initiative and um, has co-promoted it for the past years. Uh, which typically has meant that they give us um, access to a lot of spaces um, and that they give us free lodging for a range of people, which is also extremely helpful um, in terms of being able to provide something for the associations. We've always been really um, horizontal about our organization so that really um, we don't create any distinction between like the Nigerian grocer and the Uffizi galleries. For us, that's, that's, that's like same plane. And actually, when we think about sort of like um, like who our, authority, our authorities are and who we're really looking to, right? It really changes the dynamics of power. Um, and I think that, um, you know, that said, opening our brand new space, of course, presents another challenge because for now we've been doing things in other people's spaces. Now with our own space, which is a collaboration with uh, Santa Reparata International School of Art, um, it's been, uh, it's definitely a forthcoming challenge, right? Um, and I think a lot of people have talked to me about, um, you know, when it comes to sort of startups, a lot of the language that hangs out there is um, uh, sustainability. Like, is it sustainable? Can you sustain it? And um, I think that, you know, I, I come from a, a sort of background in art, a way of thinking about art, a way of thinking about like monuments and, you know, uh, that I'm really interested in like pushing back and rejecting the idea that things need to last forever. Um, we, we've seen that monuments lasting forever is not really a great thing. And you can think about Italy and monuments to colonial violence that go back into antiquity, right? That are of course gonna be there forever. Um, they were designed for that. Um, 
And um, in order to sort of re reject that as well, I think that the idea of sustainability is really important in terms of just like, you know, personal health, right? Being able to care for ourselves in the process of doing this work. But um, at the same time, I think that in this work, it's a lot about sort of pushing the, the next person, developing, I don't do anything by myself. So it's always the group, the team that comes together, uh, the individuals that might be inspired by this work that might join us in doing that work. And, you know, the only thing that could be sustainable is if people pick up the pieces and begin to do that work on their own. So there's more of us and that way the energy can sort of be, be shared. Um, but the funding is, yeah, it's an issue. Uh, it's a big issue. Um, I've looked to private sources. Um, I've looked, to, we're in the process of forming a 501c3 in the US to try to seek funding there. Italian funding is almost non-existent. Um, it's really almost non-existent. And it happens typically through um, uh, grants, open calls. Those open calls tend to be designed to where the window is open for about a week. Then the, the results come back and you have about one month to completely spend and conclude that project. Usually they give you about between 50, uh, 30 and 50% of what you've asked for. And so like all of those things really don't line up with uh, any form of sustainability in relation to that. But it's a good question. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's I think, uh, an, an interesting also, you know, response for our students and in, in terms of like, if they're interested in trying to get something off the ground, it, you know, you've, you've provided a, a, you know, an interesting model of how to do a lot with a little um, and just, I think, really, really um, terrific. Um, there's a, a question from uh, Karen. Uh, Karen, I don't know if you want to unmic or I can just read it off. Um, so uh, she says, uh, Justin, you began your talk by sharing how you and your Black History Month Florence collaborator felt similar longings for and concepts of home. Can you elaborate on what home means to you and how BHMF has impacted you? Yeah, um, that's a really great question. Um, yeah, so I mean, I mentioned uh, Andre Halyard and uh, that statement, which was, which really threw me off when he said it, actually, the first time he said it, I didn't know I knew what he, talk, he was talking about. And then he repeated it and I knew exactly what he was talking about. Um, and so it was this thing that took some time to sink in and then I sort of found myself in that statement. Um, you know, um, I think I have to say that like when I first moved over here, I spent probably the first uh, 10 years of being in Italy, traveling to the United States in order to find conversations around blackness. Um, and it's not because they weren't here, but it was because I didn't perceive them to be here. Um, and so I felt like maybe what I needed was the conversation that was happening back home, back in the US, which was a conversation that I was fairly familiar with. I wanted to be in touch with, I wanted to sort of keep a sense of um, what's happening on the ground and you know, what am I maybe missing, right? I uh, was in touch with a lot of different outlets for doing that um, and I consistently went back to the United States. I, I, I was part of many really incredible gatherings of artists um, like Black Artist Retreat, which is something that's put together by Theaster Gates, um, incredible conferences like um, uh, Black Portraitures, which has been sort of a family for me. Um, and I think that those experiences, like the more years I was here, the more I found that when I went back into those conversations, the conversations that they were having weren't um, exactly the conversation that connected to where I was living and how I was living. And a lot of times I felt that those conversations actually didn't even perceive that there could be this other thing, right? Um, and so it really kind of, it helped me to sort of think about the limitations of the ways in which we frame blackness um, uh, within the context of the US and the ways in which actually a lot of the, the language and perceptions and theory um, that people are using around the world comes from the US. Um, but then a lot of times the US uh, per perception might not even include those, those realities. Um, and so I think there's some interesting conflict that was born out of being in these spaces and in a certain sense being called to represent Italy in those spaces because a lot of times people say, hey, what's happening you know, real simply Actually, the turning point for me to really start organizing back home was two things. One, I was speaking at a conference at the University of Maryland um, uh, at the David Driscoll Center um, that was called New Critical Perspectives in African American History. And I'm sorry, African American Art History. And I, I was one of the only artists that was speaking, um, uh, which I was sort of surprised by because I guess I didn't go to that many conferences. I didn't realize there's not that many artists. Um, and um, I was talking uh, there and the, the moderator of the conversation, who's an incredible uh, person named Huey Copeland, 
he asked me a very basic question. He said, hey, what's, what's going on in Italy in relation to blackness? And I found out that I could, I've been here almost 10 years. I could not answer that question. Um, not because I didn't like know and because I didn't see, but because I hadn't really focused on what kind of scholarship, um, what kind of conversations were actually happening here, right? So I, I knew about a lot of things, but I didn't really know in order to be able to tell that, to be able to narrate that. And so I, that was the first time I was really called upon to really represent in some way this other place where, I, where I've been living. Um, and um, it really woke me up to um, a lot of things that I might be leaving out. And then ex attending Black Artist Retreat in the context of Chicago in 2014, uh, one of the things that the Astor Gates does is he really calls on everyone in the room, and it's a lot of us, to really think about what we could be doing where we are. Um, so he's presented this sort of wonderful platform, this wonderful reality. And he's like, you know, we need more of these. Um, and that really hit home um, and uh, really matched with a lot of things. So I mean, home for me, um, Home for me means a lot of different things. Um, I've never really had, um, you know, a city that I identify with um, growing up. I was born in Peekskill, New York, lived there till I was 10. Then I lived in so many different cities and so many different states that home was never really about some sort of geography. Um, and that's true also being here. Home isn't really about like Italy um, for me. It's about something else. Um, in that context of, uh, that Andre was talking about, home was some sort of sense of um, connection some sort of sense of to where we can be in conversation with each other without having to spill a whole history lesson, right? Um, and I think that that's something that is really, uh, really to be treasured. Um, I have a, a question, I'm just curious, um, what has it been like just in terms of your own studio practice to be a contemporary artist in Florence, a city that's so closely associated with and really kind of defined by the Renaissance and, and have you seen attitudes towards contemporary art change over time? Yeah, I mean, that's a really, uh, that's a really great question. I mean, you know, in a sense, I think Florence, um, you know, in big part, thanks to Vasari, um, sort of wrote itself into the, the center of the history of the Renaissance. Um, and that sort of self, it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. So that like still to this day, um, Vasari is like sort of cited in that way of like really, he said that Florence is at the center, and so it is. Um, and we sort of uh, really buy into that. And in a lot of ways, um, I, for a long time, I've kind of changed my perception on this, but for a long time, I used to say that in Florence, there's only two periods that you can talk about. One is the Renaissance, um, and the other one is 1966, which was a really historic and devastating flood that hit Florence. And some of the reasons why you can talk about that really devastating flood is because it put the Renaissance works at risk. Um, you know, there was a lot of damage. Um, and um, there's a lot of ways in which like the sort of um, the selling, the marketing of Florence as this Renaissance city. And I mean, that happens across Italy, um, any, everywhere where it's like, you know, this is the medieval city. This is the Renaissance city. This is the Gothic city. And those, that language is uh, so misleading uh, because of course, like if we think of Florence as a Renaissance city, then we forget all of the histories that preceded the Renaissance. So we think we forget Florence as a, you know, um, as a space that existed in antiquity and was actually occupied as a city. Um, and um, we forget um, the impact of World War II when Florence was, you know, well, Florence was fascist for a long stretch, then it was occupied by Nazis. It was bombed drastically, right? Um, all those things are gone if we sort of, um, you know, think about the Renaissance alone. Um, that Florence in relation to sort of colonial history in Italy, right? And the development of a lot of um, agricultural development for the colonies in Eritrea and Ethiopia um, and the ways in which this city really impacted that as well and sort of stood for those things. Um, so it's easy to sort of forget all those traces when we just talk about the Renaissance. And what's happened is that the building code in Florence is such where you're not allowed to build outside of um, Renaissance looking facades, right? And so you have a short list of colors that you're allowed to use uh, for the facade, short list of colors you can use for the shutters, terracotta on the roof, or maybe some plastic, you know, but it has to look like that. Um, and I get it. And, you know, it works, you know, but, but it's, it's interesting how much we're policing the aesthetic and why we're policing that aesthetic. And when so much is invested in that construction, it becomes really hard to get beyond it. Um, contemporary art in the context of Florence is something that in my experience, um, there's a real lack of a sense of uh, community 
first and foremost. Um, and um, that's something that's been really damaging to my experience of being a contemporary artist here is that it's been really hard to look for and find and connect with the community uh, of artists. Um, in fact, most of the time, I feel um, more connected to sort of a broader community that isn't necessarily artists, but are people engaged in the kind of work that I've been doing. Um, uh, because the, the art realm uh, tends to be really complicated. There's very few safe havens. Um, Villa Romana, for the past um, years, under the directorship of Angelica Stefkin, who is sadly on her way out, um, has, has represented one of the few places where there's, there's community, um, where you actually encounter individuals that are not necessarily all artists, but they're all there to sort of engage in a certain kind of conversation. Um, but I mean, you know, for my own practice, um, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I, I sort of, as, as a really, really young artist, um, when I first moved over here, I think I went through a lot of um, thinking about strategies, right? Because um, it was clear, um, a lot of people had told me, actually, I had an ongoing conversation with a great friend of mine, Andrew Smaldone, who's one of the few artists that I, I consistently sort of keep up with, um, who's based here in Florence. He's also from Tennessee. Um, and um, he was talking about making art, contemporary art, in Florence as this gesture of jumping from the towel. And the jumping from the towel thing was this reference to um, the um, uh, Jesse Owens in the Olympics um, in Berlin and the fact that they kept disqualifying him uh, because, and, and you know, um, one um, long jumper decided to tell him if he dropped his towel and jumped from that towel, they couldn't say that he stepped on the line. And so he took a loss he jumped for like, you know, maybe 30 centimeters extra uh, to be jumping from that towel, but he still like, you know, won. Um, and so um, it's more of like that long distance thing, but I think that art is always this sort of long distance um, work. Like you can't really think about art in any sort of short term anything. And so time is so, um, you know, really um, loose and, and, and open and elastic that I think that when we appreciate the long haul, it changes the way we think about ambition. It changes the way we think about making work. And when you're in a place like Florence, where like the they, like the, the Duomo was literally worked on for hundreds and hundreds of years, um, and so it changes your perception of what what kind of work is possible if you really sort of dedicate yourself to it and get other people behind it. Um, and you know, my own practice has sort of moved around in a way. Um, I've got a lot of work I do in Spain. I've done a lot of work in the U.S., Italy. Um, it's only more recently that there's been more interest in the kind of work that I'm doing, um, mainly through my uh, fellowship that I have right now, the Italian Council. Um, I don't know if that'll change. Um, I'm okay with it. Um, you know, I've got plenty of things to do. And actually, in the meantime, all of this work around Black History Month Florence has become uh, sort of a part of my artistic practice as well. So yeah, I think we have another question, right? Um, and, uh, yes, would you wait? Yeah. Um, hi, Justin. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering how do you manage your, your two roles, both as like an artist and a cultural facilitator? Because um, so I have my own art practice, but at the same time, I'm trying to work as a curator. And sometimes I find it really difficult to like shift between the two, two, culture, two identities even because they use different parts of your brain. Right, right. Yeah, and that's a really great question. And yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, we like wearing multiple hats is always challenging. Um, uh, you have to know that as a, as a student, I was um, this student that was always told by my teachers that um, I had to stop doing some of the projects that I was doing and focus on making a body of work or focus on making one sort of thing. And because um, I was making like 20, um, always. And um, I fortunately rejected that idea um, that I should stop working on something to sort of focus on one. And I kept focusing on everything. Um, and it took me a long time to sort of connect the dots between what those things were doing and what the relationship was. But um, I'm, I'm really glad I held on to that because it actually, um, it sort of trains you to be able to sort of really think about all these different things at the same time, understand their intersections, understand the ways in which they might actually um, make each thing stronger, right? So of course, all the work that I've done um, as an activist, as a cultural facilitator has strengthened my artwork. It's, um, they're all revolving around the same idea. Um, but the same is true, I mean, uh, uh, my role as a father, I have two daughters. Um, my role as a teacher, I typically teach anywhere between four and seven courses. Um, all of these things are uh, sort of things that, that um, 
come from the same impulse. And so because of that, they, um, they get delivered with similar energy. And it means that things are going to be messy. Uh, and it means that things might not be done to the best of your ability, right? Because that's also a truth, right? Like, you know, sometimes it's like, yeah, you know, I'm sure that if I just was doing uh, the cultural facilitator, if I was just doing Black History Month Florence and all of that work, I could probably do it better. Um, but that's not the way things go down, right? And uh, uh, I don't think that I would be feeding myself properly um, if I didn't engage in all of these things so that, you know, fatherhood really inspires and feeds the ways in which I, I'm an activist, right? Um, in the same way that like, you know, my, my artistic practice really feeds, uh, you know, being, a, being involved as a, as a curator, a part of a curatorial collective, um, you know, knowing what it means to be an artist and to be cared for is so important because when you work within institutions, a lot of institutions don't really know how to care for the artist. Um, and so as an artist, you kind of know what's needed. You know the kind of things you would not want to have to deal with. And that's the kind of thing that you can kind of take over. And so I think that it's really just sort of about thinking about the relationship between those things. And I think when, um, you know, art is one of those things that like, you know, for, for me as, a, as an artist, I, I think I would be a very miserable person if I wasn't making art. Um, in the few moments where I have like a super lull in the studio, um, I, I need to sort of up that uh, input somewhere else. Otherwise I start to really be low, right? Um, and so um, it's about finding where you need to put that energy in any given moment. Um, and about knowing that, yeah, things, you know, you could probably do those things better if you were to abandon them. Just like when I was a student, I probably could have like made better paintings if I left like cinematography alone, but it didn't work like that, you know? And for me, I was okay with being the kind of painter that I was and being the kind of filmmaker that I was. Um, and those things fed each other um, and they will continue. So if you think about it in that really long road, right? Maybe at some point those things sort of balance out in this really sort of magical way, but maybe also they don't. Um, maybe they always are sort of a struggle. Maybe there's always sort of a bit of a conflict between them, uh, but you can learn from them. And I think that um, really appreciating uh, the relationship between everything you do and knowing that you don't have to really split yourself, right? And that, you, you know, we, we're, we're constantly playing all of these different roles. Um, and, you know, is, as long as sort of what's guiding all of that is coming from the same place, then it, you don't have to really search too hard for the connecting tissues. But good luck. I mean, like, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good thing to, to be involved with also because I think that you start to appreciate um, some of the different ways in which you can contribute um, to the world around you. You can contribute to sort of shaping the way that people appreciate art, which we have an incredibly long road to go down um, before there's more of a general public appreciation for art. If that's something that we care about from a social standpoint, um, you know, the value that's given to art more broadly by society is, um, is, is really shallow um, and quite sad. Um, we, in talking about contemporary art in Florence, the boom right now is really typical of Florence and it's a gigantic Jeff Koons show, right? And so um, it, it just talks about the fact that it's really easy to go in and see some art, but not really have to think about anything or um, you know, not really have to dive into any sort of social significance outside of something that's actually really um, upsetting, <laughs> right? Um, it, but and also the ways in which you can actually narrate those things in space, the relationship between art and entertainment, all of these things are incredibly problematic and it's going to take a lot of thinkers to get us past that. Thank you um, so much, Justin. I, I think we're we're at um, time, but maybe if um, anyone wants to stay after for a few minutes, we can sort of informally continue a, a discussion. Um, but for now, I, I, I'd like to thank you again, Justin, uh, on behalf of uh, Diane and the Department of Art and Art History. Um, we're so glad that you were able to, to join us and, and to stay up uh, late your time to be able to be with us in, in Los Angeles time. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for the, the invitation. And I mean, uh, today was this sort of magic day of um, uh, going through and doing, um, you know, a public event in our space that sort of enriched and fed some of the ways in which I was thinking about this conversation tonight. So it's good to continue. Uh, thank you so much, Justin. It was so great to hear you speak about everything you're doing. 
yeah, when you come when you come to Florence, please, you're welcome. I mean, the space of the recovery plan is uh, is there. Um, it's yeah, planned, it's waiting for everyone to come see. Yeah, I'm excited. I hope they can come sometime soon. Well, one thing that might also be interesting to, to see is if we could collaborate in the future, maybe having some students in Los Angeles doing some work on, you know, some of the projects I'm thinking, you know, from the art history perspective, you know, if there are things that that might be helpful, could be a contribution, um, we could, you know, talk about that uh, in, in the future. I think it could be really, really interesting. Certainly. I mean, there's a whole lot of work to be, to be done. Um, really, it's sort of endless. And um, the great thing is we've really been mapping and mining sort of um, the different archives, the different uh, traces that are there, um, and also the different individuals that are keepers of this knowledge. And, um, you know, so we're, we're just trying to make sure that we can share it as broadly as possible. And also the context of the U.S. is one where, um, you know, Italian cultural uh, societies, Italian cultural institutions are, are all over the United States, and they have very, very rarely talked about blackness in any way. So um, there's a lot of work to be done in the U.S. as well in sort of reshaping and rethinking what uh, Italian culture and Italian identity actually mean. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I don't know if any of our remaining students had a question or if our remaining students had a question or maybe not. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, thanks so much. And I mean, uh, we will um, be uh, sort of sharing different things. You can follow us on like social media. Um, uh, and um, it's just Black History Month, black.history.month.florence. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we have BHMF on Facebook. And then our website is really out of date, but it is up to date. And so mm -hmm. um, definitely a way to sort of get a sense of what we're into. Um, and yeah, I really appreciate the invitation. Yeah, and and just thanks once again, also, you know, for all the work that you've done with the Uffizi, I think that that's, you know, particularly useful from from my end to be able to have something that, that you know, I can point students to that they can access um, and that, you know, hopefully will remain up on the Uffizi website, you know, and, and have additions to. Um, it's yeah. it really I, I find particularly impressive that that the Uffizi, you know, has has engaged with with this project because I've always seen the museums just in general in Florence as being very, very conservative institutions that don't really think outside the kind of Renaissance box. Um, yeah. And the Uffizi, I think, in recent years has been doing some some very dynamic things, which may be related also to new directorship and kind of outside vision um but that's great yeah i mean there's some interesting developments that have come out of it we're actually curating a project um, that will open in april um at palazzo Pitti, so through the uffizi galleries um with a contemporary artist um, named sammy Bologi. he's an mm -hmm. artist from democratic republic of congo and he's been doing work over the years um, including in uh, documentas from years back Mm -hmm. um, looking at objects that come from the um, ancient kingdom of Congo um, and that are held within, um, a lot of them are held within Italian collections um, that were given as like diplomatic gifts to the Medici's, for example, causing the Medici. And um, he's really sort of doing work around these objects and we're putting together a bit of a retrospect that includes also a new um, production that he's making um, in relation to two objects um, that were part of Cosimo's uh, collection. And um, that'll open in April. Uh, it's got a catalog that accompanies it and um, it'll be a great opportunity to sort of think also about um, Africa through uh, material culture right in ways in which we you know we might maybe those like those objects which were made in the uh, ancient kingdom of Congo say something more about representation than about presence right um, and I think that there's a lot of ways in which we're going to be able to wrestle with some of those questions and the director has been um, really fantastic about um, diving into that project and stepping towards it um, encouraging it, and he's done a lot of research, so he also has a lot of insight in relation to those objects and their placement within history. That's great. Yeah, I'm going to definitely have to check that out. Cool. Well, thanks well, thank again. Thank you so much. Yeah, y'all have it's a great day, and um, you know, really appreciate you inviting me in, and hopefully, it uh, opens up a few uh, avenues of thought that will be, um, you know, something yeah. that you can nurture over um, the rest of the semester and maybe beyond. For sure. Thank you again, Justin. Thank you. That's an amazing guitar collection, by the way. <laughs>
that's that's a few of them. Yeah, got got some oh. guitars. <laughs> Uh, it's it's what like it's that's my like five minute break. I just like grab a, any guitar off the wall and just do something with that. It kind of keeps me keeps me calm. Okay. All right, y'all take care. Okay, great. We'll, we'll have a good night. See you again. Okay.